like to welcome you to the UNBC Speaker Series this afternoon. Looks like we have a good audience. Um, I'm Ed Harrison, and I'm replacing Bruce Bidgood, who is the campus chair acting, and uh, he's away right now. I'd like to introduce uh, Greg Knox, who um, is going to speak with Skeena Wild. And listening to you on the radio this morning, I thought there were three themes, glaciers, water flow, and sound. Uh, well, and more, quite a bit more, so <laughs> thank you, Ed. I really appreciate being able to come and give this presentation. Uh, I've been doing salmon conservation work in the Skeena for over 10 years, and uh, this issue, of course, is, is a really important one for us. Uh, but I had to do a lot of work to prepare for this presentation because climate change and the impacts and the impacts of climate change to salmon are so complex. And often we don't know exactly, we can't say, oh, this you know, flood event was a cause of climate change because it's not really connected. But when you see, start to see patterns and stuff and you see what else is going on out there and you look at some of the scientific work, um, you can get a pretty good idea of some of the stuff that's happening. So I'm going to be talking about uh, kind of what we're seeing here in the scheme already and what may or may not be climate change impacts. Mostly I would say they're related to climate change and the shifting climate. <clears throat> and then I'm going to talk about, and, and I'm also going to talk about how those things have been impacting or may have been impacting salmon. I'm going to talk about uh, what some of the predictions are, what we, might, what we can expect into the future. And uh, I will also talk about solutions and, and what we can do about it and uh, some of the interesting things about the resilience of salmon and Skeena salmon in particular. So, I'll start off with uh, this little young Chinook salmon. So, she is swimming in the eelgrass habitat on Flora Bank at the mouth of the Skeena River here. Um, and she has quite a complicated life, uh, traversing a very large area. So. You know, Chinook come from lots of different tributaries in the Skeena, the Sastat, the Upper Skeena, Babine, Susquehanna, Balkley, Kitwanga, all over the place. Uh, uh, let's just say this one was born in the Kitsum-Kalem River, right near Terrace here. And she would have hatched out of the gravel in um, April, May, and then spent a, most likely about a year, some of them spent two years in the river feeding, growing, and after that, uh, typically the following uh, late spring, early summer, they start to head down the river and make their way to the ocean, uh, to the mouth of the river, to this area. And this is the Skeena River here, so they come down, and then of course, in this area is a, a mix of fresh and salt water, and they, they have to go through a lot of physiological changes in their body to adapt from fresh water to salt water, find new sources of food, avoid new predators, deal with currents and waves, stuff that they're not used to dealing with in the ocean. And they spend anywhere from a week to a month or two here, uh, feeding, growing, adapting. And it's a really important and vulnerable time of their life. And then they start to head north. And the currents along the coast of BC generally push north, so they essentially go with the currents and work through all these little nooks and crannies, feeding, growing, those sorts of things as they, as they head north. And so, on this slide we'll focus here. This is uh, where they travel, so this is the, the mouth of the Skeena here, and they travel up the coast of southeast Alaska, and then out into the uh, Alash Alaskan gyre, it's called, in the North Pacific, south of the Aleutian Islands. And they spend anywhere from one year to four years in the North Pacific, feeding, growing. And they, some of them even go as far over as Kamchatka, or close off the shore of Kamchatka and Russia. So huge areas, and that's just the Chinook salmon. You can see this is Sockeye, Range, Chum, Coho, Pink. See Coho and Pink stay a little closer to home. So uh, quite complex. 
And I guess that's really the story, is this is complicated, incredibly complicated, because we're not only dealing with Chinook salmon, we're dealing with pink and chum and coho and sockeye and steelhead. And uh, they're all doing different, similar yet different things out there. And for example, uh, a sockeye will live in a lake for a year or two, most of them, whereas the rest of the species will, will be born in the river and live in the river. Pink and chum will be born in the river and then leave right away and spend a lot of time in the estuaries. So, and then of course within those, within those species there's <coughs> all sorts of unique populations and within those populations there's different individuals using different habitats. And in the Skeena we have over 300 individual populations of, of salmon. So, and of course, climate change impacts all these different environments in very complex ways. And so, and often very unpredictable ways. And so, this is a real challenge, trying to understand how, what, you know, how climate change is impacting our salmon and what we can expect to see into the future and how we deal with it. So this is a very simple diagram of the life cycle and how some of the impacts we see during different phases. Uh, when there are eggs or alevins in the gravel or just coming out of the gravel, uh, floods can be a big problem, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, when there are juvenile fish in the river, they can experience earlier freshet, meaning earlier snow melt, earlier runoff in the, in the rivers. Uh, they can experience warmer lower flows in summer, so that limits their habitat. It can put stress on them in various ways, uh, change food. And then, uh, of course, they go to the estuary where there's a lot of challenges there, finding new food sources, and climate can shift the temperatures in the ocean, in the estuary, and that changes the, the different types of food and stuff like that, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, and then they go to the ocean where y the warming can have serious impacts uh, and acidification. I'll, I'll, I'll chat more about that as well. <coughs> of course, when they come back, the adults, a big challenge for them is warm, low flows. Uh, so we'll get into all that stuff in more detail. This is just a more complicated scientific version of that slide with much more detail. And sorry, it's a little bit uh, fuzzy, but it basically showing you that there's, it, it impacts them in all sorts of complicated ways. So, the big question, one of the most challenging questions is, are we already seeing climate change impacts in the Skeena? And that's, that's a difficult one to tease out because, of course, we always have variations in our weather and our climate over time. We always have. And teasing apart whether these different events we're seeing here in the Skeena are whether attached to climate change is really challenging. <coughs> Some of the things we have seen is about a, a mean average increase in this, in the terrace Kitimat area, of about half a degree. So that might not sound like much, but of course it's not just half a degree throughout the year. It might be normal for long periods, but then you get a really warm spell or a really cold spell or, or whatever. So it's, it's more, there's, there's more kind of typically extremes, extreme events is where you see the, the changes. <coughs> and we seem to be seeing more of those extreme events here in the Skeena. Uh, we also see glaciers receding really rapidly, especially in the last couple decades. Uh, mountain pine beetle epidemic, forest fires increasing in, in uh, scale and, and intensity, uh, more into the interior, that stuff. But the Skeena, of course, extends into the ex exterior, into the Nechaco Plateau, up in the Babine country, in the Maurice, Bulkley area. And of course, we also see climate change happening in other parts of the world. Uh, you know, Arctic sea ice has decreased by summer Arctic sea ice has decreased by 50% since the 1980s. Uh, we see hurricanes in the Caribbean uh, that are much more intense and have doubled in frequency since the 1980s. We see ocean acidification has increased by about 30% since the 1980s. So there's lots of stuff going on out there and there's a lot more examples of what we're seeing around us. So we can assume that if it's happening in all these other places, it's probably impacting us here. 
So this is a satellite image of what's called an atmospheric river. And it's just a term for describing a really intense storm coming off of the North Pacific or off the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is just laden with precipitation or with uh, moisture, these clouds. And once they hit landfall along Washington, Oregon, California, or BC, they cause these huge precipitation or snow of rain or snow events. And <coughs> this one's actually from just the weekend. It just hit the south coast. And this warm weather and some of the rain we experienced a few days ago was associated, that was kind of the edge of this atmospheric river hitting, hitting the coast south of us. So this is the Copper River and uh, what we've seen this fall are, are some big precipitation events which have really quite stunning. This is from the highway bridge looking downstream and I drove over this bridge in uh, I think around September 9th and I couldn't believe what I was seeing because just trees and logs and the, the water volume coming down this river. I don't, I've never seen that and I've lived here for 16 years but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen of course just because I haven't seen it but um, it was quite intense and then of course we had another one in late October which was even more intense. And the, the challenge with that is, of course, most of the salmon have already been in the river in August, September, laid their eggs. And so with that much water, we're getting huge amounts of gravel being moved around, the river changing in a lot of places. So it can flush out the eggs. Some of them may get moved around and redeposited and be okay. Some might get buried too deep or too close to the surface. Uh, others might get washed away and die or be eaten by trout and stuff. So that, that, can, be a, that can have a big impact in these really big events. Uh, there's also changes in the habitat I mentioned and flushing of nutrients. So a lot of those salmon, or those salmon died. A lot of them were in the river getting caught in log jams or on the shore or whatever. Of course, you get this huge rain event and it flushes all those nutrients out of the system. Uh, preferably you want a lot of those nutrients to stay. You want them to break down in the river, feed the aquatic insects in the river which feed the juvenile salmon. So that's another challenge. And we also saw a lot of landslides in these precipitation events. And I talked to the fisheries, the stream walker who work, walks the coasts, and he said he's never seen it, so many landslides out there before as he saw this fall. And that was, I talked to him after the September events. We had, of course, another event after that. This is on the Clore River, big landslide, I apologize, the picture's not good, uh, into the river. And of course, impacts from, sediment, from all this sediment going into the river, it can change the river geology, uh, it can choke out the spawning gravels, essentially cover the gravel in silt so the salmon don't get that oxygenated water coming through, and they suffocate, and uh, it can impact water quality in big ways. <coughs> So that's another uh, potential impact we're seeing from these changes. It's just the increase in frequency of these events. And of course, this is a hydrograph for the Copper River showing the big spike, just <coughs> incredibly quick spike, which we usually see it happen a little bit more gradually, but these incredibly fast spikes in, in water in the river going up and down. Uh, so these are the two events. And we don't, it's pretty rare I looked in the hydrological record and I didn't see any other years where we had two big spikes for the Copper River like we did this year. So high flows are a problem due to these big precipitation events, but also low flows. So this is the uh, Skeena River at Ask. Uh, and we saw, we've seen many years in, in of the recent years having these really low flows in August and September. So you see this, this blue line is the lowest flows we've ever recorded. And this is the red line was, was this year, which is 2013. And this green line is the highest flows we've ever recorded. So really, really low flows in that August, September time period. And again, you see that in 2014 in here. And again in 2016, really low flows in August and September. And of course, that's when most of our fish are coming through the Skeena and traveling up to spawn, and this just adds more stress on them. 
It can delay their migration. It can change how they migrate. Uh, increase the vulnerability to fisheries. So of course, you don't have much water. You have the same amount of fish. They're easier to catch in a lot of, in a lot of times. Um, warmer temperatures, which is a, which is a, which causes a lot of problems for the fish. I'll talk more about. This is the Babine in 2016. This is a tributary of Babine Lake, and you can see these red things here are sockeye salmon. Uh, so a lot of the tributaries to Babine Lake salmon either couldn't get up the tributaries in 2016, or they got up and then got <coughs> trapped or whatever. So this, this, these low flows can be a real problem in, in these tributaries, in these spawning streams. And in the Babine particularly because there's not very many mountains around to feed with snow or glaciers or, or stuff like that. So if you get a dry spell in the summer, you can get these really low flows. And it can prevent them from going up, of course. Uh, increase the predation. These are really easy to pick off by a bear or an eagle or a wolf, whatever. They're, they're, they're sitting ducks. Um, and it can e increase stress because the water temperature is warmer, of course. Just having, this is a dog right here, you know. You walk near salmon and they'll scatter all over the place and, and stress out. You can imagine being constantly bombarded with eagles and different predators trying to catch you. This is another photo from another tributary in the Babine. This is the uh, Babine, uh, Lake Babine Nation fisheries crew trying to create a ditch in a, in a effort to enable salmon to be able to get up this, this creek because the lake's right here and they couldn't get past this big, this big gravel sill. So they were trying to make a little path. And you can see how little water is in there. So that the, a lot of fish in, can get trapped in the lake and not be able to get up these smaller streams. And not only the Babine, but the Kitwonga River, this is 2016 as well. The Gitniao have never seen this channel go dry before of the channel of the Kitwonga River. So we also have challenges with pre-spawning mortality, which is salmon don't successfully lay their eggs and spawn. Uh, they die before they, they're able to do that. Disease and parasites. And in the Skeena, we're in a pretty good place. We have cool water, which is good, because parasites with warm water, they multiply, they can take hold, they can cause a lot more damage than with warm water. So this is uh, just a few photos. This is from the central coast of a big die off of chum salmon. This is uh, IHC disease and a sockeye salmon. Uh, so this, this has been an issue in Babine Lake on some years, uh, but generally we haven't been seeing it too much yet. Uh, it is a real issue for Fraser sockeye though, because temperatures in the Fraser are commonly reaching uh, in the 18 <coughs> to 20 plus degree range, which causes real problems for salmon. Above 16 degrees, you start to see impacts on salmon. It can, they can slow, slow them down and, and cause stress. At 18 degrees, there can be serious stress and, and some of them could even die. Uh, at 20, 21 degrees, it's le water temperatures can become lethal for salmon. So in the Fraser, a large percentage of the sockeye in some years are dying before they reach the spawning channels because of these warm, warm streams. So in the skiing, like I said, we're good because we're a lot cooler. We're further north. We have glacial inputs, you know, more precipitation, those sorts of things, which help a lot. But it's something that we kind of have to keep our eye on. And snowpack's another thing, change we've been seeing. Uh, this is uh, a map from the River Forecast Center, February 1st, 2016. So you can see 62% of normal snowpack. Uh, as of May 1st of the same year, it was about 47% of normal. And then, of course, later in the year, we saw the hydrograph of the Skeena River. It was really low. It's because the snow melted, and then there's nothing left to feed it in July and into August. So those sorts of variations in snowpack and years of low snowpack seem to be coming more common. Uh, and this, of course, can impact the water levels and migration, susceptibility to fisheries, those sorts of things. 
We've also seen receding glaciers, and this is, you guys probably know this, this is the Bear River Glacier up near Stewart. This is a picture taken from the highway, 1958 and 2015, so a huge change melting away uh, over that 57 year period. So that's a challenge uh, in some of our watersheds because you can see a lot of the Skeena doesn't have a lot of glaciers, but in some areas we do. This, this blue is, is gl our glaciers. So in the lower Skeena in some of the systems, there's a lot of glaciers. Uh, this is in the copper system, big glacial system. Uh, and this is in the upper parts of the upper Skeena. There's a lot of glaciers. So in those areas, uh, this issue can be a challenge. And over the last, between 1985 and 2005, there was a, these glaciers decreased in size by 15%. They lost 15%. And these are just some numbers from the individual rivers. You can see the Exjamsix between that period lost 8%. Exdu River lost 21%. Copper lost 10%. Kitsum Kalem lost almost 20%, and of course that was just a 2005, add another 12 years and even more loss. So why this is, is, is important because uh, what it means is you're removing the glacial melt in July and August and sometimes into September. And so of course that's when salmon are in the river, and you take this this out and you get a uh, uh, hydrograph that's more like this. That means low flows, of course, lower flows, much lower flows, and warmer water when salmon are going into the river to spawn. And uh, that can have all the challenges we've discussed. So in the short term, though, those glaciers add, add a bit of a buffer for us because they are providing, even if we get a dry summer in these systems, we're getting glacier water input into the river, so the, so the salmon are, are okay. So this is the, this is uh, Flora Bank, Lilu Island, mouth of the Skeena River. As I mentioned, this is a place where a, a lot of our salmon spend time, upward 70, 80 percent of our juvenile salmon hang out in this general area. And it's another place where we're seeing some changes. Uh, there's not as much information on what we're seeing here, but there's some predictions that this is going to warm. And with warmer water, what it means is there's not as much uh, phytoplankton growing, because uh, the, the phytoplankton really like the, the cooler, more, it's typically more nutrient-rich water. And the types of phytoplankton that grow in warmer water are different, and they're, they're not as nutrient-rich, so they're not as good for salmon. And so when these fish come out at, whoops, of the Skeena River, they could have, you know, challenges finding food. There's also, if they come out earlier, if, because if, salmon often time their migration with how fast they grow in the river. So that could change when they actually migrate out of the river. And if they come out at a time when there's not as much food around, then that could have impacts as well. And there's some information to suggest we might see increases in uh, acidification here, which I'll talk about more. So well, the biggest driver is the ocean for this, our salmon productivity. It, the, the estuary and the ocean are where if the conditions are bad or if they are good, it has huge impacts on salmon. So of course, if there are good conditions out there in the North Pacific, we see lots, a lot more of salmon returning to our streams. If there's poor conditions, not very many. Um, this is what's called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It's just a normal climate phenomena. This is the temperature of the North Pacific. Goes up and down over 10, 20, 30 years. It'll go down and then it'll come back up again. And so that's normal. That's been happening for thousands of years. And it's not always quite as neat as consistent like this oscillation, but generally speaking, it maintains this, this kind of pattern. In recent years, we've been seeing a breakdown in the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. 
and uh, a very quick switch between cool and warm phases. So that means that the cool water is good. The, this is really good for salmon. In years of, of cold regimes of the Pacific Decay Law Oscillation, our salmon do well. In years of warm, they don't do very well. Salmon in Alaska do better when there's warmer uh, periods in, in, in the PDO, but our salmon do worse. So what this means is just these conditions out there are fluctuating more rapidly. And this is the infamous blob, um, um, a phenomenon in the North Pacific over this massive area, uh, 2,000 kilometers by 2,000 kilometers in size. Uh, it started in the fall of 2013, persisted into two to the end of 2016, and it kind of broke apart um, over the last year or so. And it is important because it had we had temperatures of two and a half, three degrees higher than normal. And of course, those warm temperatures mean less food available for salmon, less nutrient-rich food available for salmon, and then shifts in, in predators as well. So this is, this is an important, important part of the, uh, the puzzle here. And a lot of the variability and the low returns we've been seeing in recent years a lot of folks think that this was the main driver. So this is just a slide. It was looking, we had a really warm El Nino, I think in 2004, 2005, and we saw a lot of fish species that normally are off the coast of California and maybe Oregon and stuff shifting north. So mackerel, ocean sunfish, yellowtail tuna, opa, sardines, Humboldt squid. And so we can expect, if we have warmer, warmer oceans, we can expect these species to, to be shifting north. One of the challenges is mackerel like to eat juvenile salmon. And some scientists believe that mackerel have been uh, eating a lot of juvenile salmon around Vancouver Island in some years, causing some significant impacts. So the question is, there's a lot going on here. How has it been impacting our salmon in specifically? What have we been seeing with our different return runs, species? And it's really difficult to measure because we don't, we can't say, oh, that caused this. We haven't done enough science to directly link it, but there's enough information there that shows us there's stuff going on and these are likely causes. So, a uh, lot of variations in conditions and returns. It's a normal thing to have good and bad years, some species doing well, some species not. But in the past, it was much more predictable. You could look at how healthy the adults were, their parents were, the three or four years before, and you could see how many what are called jacks, so one-year-olds are returning, and you could make a pretty good prediction on what, the, what this coming season was going to be like. Well, that has totally broken down and it's becoming really, really difficult to predict uh, into the, f like now we're predicting into this n coming summer. It's just really, really hard now to make those predictions. Uh, <coughs> there's been increasing variability in some species. So that's a, a, and then smaller size of returning adults. So in species like Chinook, and sockeye, especially, some of the other species as well, we've seen smaller average sizes. And so, of course, if, if a fish is smaller, a female is smaller, it can't produce as many eggs, and the eggs themselves tend to be smaller. So that also can pose challenges. This is a graph of sockeye salmon, Skeena sockeye, uh, going dating back to 1904, I believe. And you can see the, the returns have always been variable. And what I'll kind of point you to are these, these lines. So this dark gray is the number of fish that made it back to the river to spawn. This light gray is how many were caught by the different fisheries in that year. And this dotted line is what's called the exploita exploitation rate. So in this year, uh, there was about 
60% of these fish that were coming back to Canadian waters were caught, and about 40% made it back to the river to spawn. So you can see there's always been lots of variation. Uh, this, uh, this is sockeye. In the 1950s, sockeye collapsed in this area, and that's when they put in the Pinkett and Fulton spawning channels in, ba in the Babine system to boost production again. But this collapse was due to really overfishing. You know, taking 60, 70, even almost 80% of the fish in a given year for so many years caused a collapse. Uh, in recent years, so this was boosted back up in the 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, but in recent years we've been seeing uh, much lower returns, and that's with l much lower fishing pressure. So, and, and so it's not, this, this is not caused by overfishing. Something else is going on. Uh, this is Chinook, and sorry I'm missing these years going back further, but you can see a similar pattern here. Uh, lower years, and this 2017 was even lower here. I don't have it on there. But so it's a similar pattern with Chinook. This is chum salmon. And chum salmon have, were much more abundant in the past, uh, but over the past 20 years or so, we've seen really low returns, and especially in the past, in the recent past. And you can see <coughs> the fishing pressure historically was way higher. They were taking about half of the chum out of the skeena. Now we're down around 10 to 15 percent. So the pr fishing pressure is way lower, and we're still. These fish aren't recovering. We're not seeing rebounds in the population. Uh, pink salmon are a bit all over the place, uh, more variable, but some low years we've been dealing with more recently. And then uh, coho salmon. And <coughs> coho took a big crash in the 1990s, uh, overfishing. And they did a Coastwide closure on coho, uh, cut, you can see the dramatic cut in the fishing there, and they rebounded. And they, they're more variable, like this past year we had pretty good runs of coho all over the coast. So they're, they're not doing so bad, generally. So lots of variability there. And of course, these populations, as I mentioned, these are sockeye, these are the different sockeye populations in the Skeena. Uh, the red ones are sockeye populations that aren't doing very well. And so a lot of our work's been trying to protect and rebuild these populations. Fisheries have been reducing to protect and rebuild these populations. And we're having challenges because generally the ocean conditions, the, the productivity out there is not as good as it used to be, so it's harder to rebuild these populations once they get in a red zone. So what, so a lot, I just add that the, you saw those graphs in recent years and a lot of challenges. I would uh, say, and a lot of scientists would uh, suggest that the reason for our challenges over the past kind of three, four years, three years, has been, uh, a lot of it's been because of that really big, warm ocean water, the blob out there in the North Pacific. So that's changing now. So hopefully we'll see better returns in future years. But of course, when you're dealing with fish that are out at sea for three, four, five years, they're still going to be impacted for another year or two by that warm water mass. So what can we expect to see going forward? It's, um, I've, I looked at a couple of the uh, modeling exercises have been, have been done. This is the Pacific Climate uh, Impacts Consortium. Uh, they modeled out to the 2050s. This is for Kitimat <coughs> Stikin Terrace area, so uh, it's pretty relevant. They, they're estimating a, a, an average temperature increase of 1.7 degrees. Uh, so, like I said, we've already seen an increase of about half a degree. Uh, more precipitation, mostly in the winter. Uh, less snowfall, mostly in the spring snowfall we typically get at higher elevations will be less. 
So we, this is work that was done by a number of academics in the U.S. Forest Service and uh, University of Alaska, um, a number of others who did some modeling. And this is going looking out to 2080. So this is uh, precipitation. And something went wrong there. I think I, oh no, it's right. Okay, precipitation. So they're estimating between 3 and 18 percent increase in precipitation overall. Like I said, most of that in the winter. Uh, atmospheric rivers are predicted to, those big storm events I showed you, are predicted to increase in frequency and severity for southern BC, Washington, Oregon, California. They haven't done modeling for northern BC, but they predict a 28 percent increase in those type of events. Uh, we have a uh, projected decrease in annual snowpack, uh, anywhere from <coughs> 22 to 58 percent by the modeling out to the 2080s. Uh, projected increases in mean annual temperature, uh, anywhere from a 1.7 degree increase to 5.5 degrees average increase in temperature, modeling out to 20, 2080. So some potentially big changes there. So of course this is all modeling. We don't know what will happen, but this gives us some indication of where we might be headed. And of course I, you get, can relate how these imp changes may impact our salmon. Another concern is ocean acidification. And it's the uh, evil step twin of climate change, some people call it. But uh, so basically, it's the increase of carbon dioxide we emit into the atmosphere. About a third of it gets taken up by the oceans. Uh, it reacts with seawater, turns into carbonic acid, and that it makes the, the ocean more acidic. Why that's important is because the shells, zooplankton, these tiny little animals that little salmon eat, and the food that species like herring and sardines and other medium-sized fish species eat, which salmon then eat, There's, they have, with, when the ocean acidifies, they have challenged forming their shells. This is also happening in, with shellfish, concern with shellfish farms and on the south coast in Puget Sound. Uh, so that's a concern. So lots going on there. Lots of crazy stuff going on there that we have to try to figure out how are we going to deal with all this. And so the good news is there's lots of things we can do to adapt. And uh, better monitoring. We're, we're counting about one third of the streams we used to count in the 1980s right now. So we need more money for monitoring. DFO's current recently committed more money for monitoring, so hopefully that will come through. So we need to know. You can't manage fisheries without knowing how many fish are in the streams, right? It's basic. Uh, you don't know how healthy populations are. Don't kill too many. So we need better in-season tools to figure out how many fish are coming back so we can adjust our harvest levels. Uh, set clear management actions to deal with this greater uncertainty and fluctuations year to year. So we have what's called an abundance-based management plan in the Skeena for Sockeye. It works quite well. You know, below uh, 450,000 fish, nobody goes fishing. Kind of above 600,000, First Nations can go get their food fish. Above 800,000, sport fishermen can go and harvest a few sockeye. Above 1.05 million commercial fisheries can take place. So that sets out clear goals, at least at the Skeena wide level for sockeye. We don't have those for any other species. We need them because we need to be able to deal with these issues. Uh, <coughs> we also need to implement rebuilding plans for, for these species that are in the red zone that we're having challenges with. Protect their habitat. Salmon are not going to do well if their habitat's trash. We know. We've seen what's happened in Washington and southern BC. It's just a reality. We've got to do a bit better job. You, you know, the new provincial government's committed to land use planning, updating the land use plans. We need to do that with a salmon lens on it, with a water lens on it, so that we're, our land use activities aren't 
impacting these streams. And that you know, things, simple things like leaving a few some trees on the sides of rivers, those sorts of things are important. Uh, estuary management planning. Skeena is one of the only systems on the whole coast, west coast of Canada, that doesn't that has industrial pressures that doesn't have an estuary management plan. That's something we're pushing hard for now. Uh, participate in environmental assessments. When, when projects are proposed, we need to make sure that they're not impacting our water and our fish and as best they can. Obviously, everything has impacts and we need development in the region, but we got to do a good job in trying to make sure that development's done responsibly. Citizen science, getting out there collecting this information, doing our part, and then education. Letting people understand what's going on and what we can do about it is really important. And benefit by being adaptable. That's, that's key. You know, like I said, we, we had some challenges with Sockeye and Chinook this year, but we had really good returns of coho. Let's, let's shift our more of our pressure to the species which are doing well and back off a bit on those species that aren't doing well. And we need to change that year to year, depending on what's going on out there. So this is just, uh, obviously at a global scale, we need to do a lot more to curb the actual root of the problem. And the exciting news is that we're in the midst of an energy revolution. Renewable energy is becoming really cheap, way cheaper than oil and gas. And so we're seeing a huge shift. It's just the start. We're going to see a big shift. And that big shift can go a long way to getting at the root of the problem. Uh, you know, deal with the, there's these, these shifting Reduce cumulative pressures, proactive planning, we talked about those sorts of things. So, yeah, will Skeena salmon be able to adapt? Will they be able to adapt? Well, yeah, there's hope, of course, because salmon as a species are incredibly resilient. What we're seeing now is actually salmon now populating rivers in the Arctic, uh, moving further north in, in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, we see them still. They're still down in Washington and Oregon and California even, places that have seen way more impacts. Uh, and they're still there. So that's pretty incredible. So if we give them a chance, they can persist. If we, and if we protect them, they can actually do really well. Uh, also, the Skeena is incredibly well positioned because we have, like I said, 300 unique populations, six different species. We, we can adapt. I mean, they can adapt. They're incredibly adaptive. They weren't here 10,000 years ago. There were glaciers right where we're sitting, right? So they weren't here 10,000 years ago. They moved in. They can adapt. They're incredibly adaptable. We just have to make sure that, that we maintain the diversity so that they're able to do that. Give them a chance. Our northern location is incredibly advantageous. Cooler climate, like I said. Yes, there's some challenges around temperature, but compared to river systems like the Fraser, we're way better off. Uh, there's also you know, precipitation. We, we're, we're forecast to actually increase slightly on precipitation, which is a good thing for fish. Challenges some of these big events, but still, it's a good thing for fish. Uh, the other thing is some populations may become more productive. One thing I mentioned was glaciers. We have a lot of cold systems in the Skeena, in parts of the Skeena. Well, a bit of warming could actually help those systems. Uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, uh, but that could, if the now with cold glacier water, which doesn't produce ma very many aquatic insects and stuff that salmon feed on, that could change. It could be more productive. There could be more food for them in these systems. Uh, the other thing is, as glaciers retreat, of course, there's rivers left in their path and salmon can take over and they have new habitats, stuff like that. So those are things that to consider. And this is just a, some work that was done recently about looking at impacts to First Nations food fisheries. And the main thing I wanted to point out was that here in the north, we're, seeing it, we're looking at relatively low decreases in the different fish stocks that we depend on for food compared to Vancouver, southern Vancouver Island and places. So we're in a pretty good position. And that's it.
happy to take questions. Looks like we have a bit of time. Anyone has any? Al? Uh, you talked about 30% increase in acidity. Uh, is that, how does that translate into pH? Uh, so we've seen uh, the pH of the oceans right now, North Pacific, I think is around 8.2, uh, which is basic. You know, it's on the basic side of the spectrum, I think. Was, what is the median point? 5.6 or something? 6? Six six? Seven. It's 7? Okay. You know more than I do. Uh, but it's decreased since the 1980s by about 0.1. So it's gone from about 8.2 to 8.1. So not, not huge, but looking forward, it could, could be a real issue. And in, and in Puget Sound and places, the shellfish industry has been having some challenges with their aquaculture operations because of for these, the juveniles being able to form their shells. But I don't have specific information on how it's changed there. So that point one drop in pH, pH is a logarithmic number in the beginning. So I guess the Lord, the original number is dropped by 30%, but pH is dropped by 0.1. I guess that's how it works. Uh, yeah, from the 1980s, it's dropped by 30%. Gil? Just uh, to touch on your presentation, I noticed logging wasn't something that you touched on, and the reason I bring that up is all the years that I was a logger. <laughs> And, but now, obviously, involved heavily in the tourism industry for the last 25 years. But understanding logging and what it can have, the impacts it can have on the watershed, um, I just found it quite interesting. The highs and lows that you speak of, uh, especially on the, on the bad bean and, and a lot of the watersheds, the copper, the floor, I think that it, it definitely plays a huge factor in our highs and lows. Our Kitimat watershed is a huge example of what happened to a watershed when uh, an entire valley has been leveled. And what it does, I don't know if many people understand, I'm just certain that some people do. When you take away a forest canopy and you have uh, heavy snowpacks, <coughs> those snowpacks are no longer protected by the canopy, which is the shade, shade trees that, that shade that uh, snowpack. So when you remove that canopy it, in mass quantities, then you end up with giant solar panels, the best way I could put it. And when we do have our, our sunshine beaming down on those snowbacks, they don't last as long as they would. So you don't get a gradual melt, you get a real quick, heavy flush. And in terms of you know, what ends up happening, you end up seeing massive erosion and, and uh, rivers get destroyed. And then, hence the mudslides that you're showing on the copper and whatnot and the chlor, you know, that valley's been devastated by logging. So. Yeah, logging is can have all of those impacts. Well, it does have a lot of those impacts. Um, it's 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 a real <coughs> concern. There's no way around it. Uh, basically, you remove tree cover. You have the water goes into the rivers and streams more quickly. It's typically warmer. Those sorts of things. You can do a lot to log better, yeah. right? Like a, one thing I mentioned was just the buffers around these small streams and stuff like that, keeping the cool. The trees overhead keep the streams cool, right? So that's just one example. So an effort to do a bit better job of how we harvest our forests, right? But there will be impacts. It's just, you know, it's part of it. Yeah. I just have an online question here. Um, it's from Phil. Uh, in terms of adaptation strategies, have there been any successful ef efforts to transplant southern stocks to northern rivers? Uh, to my knowledge, it's, it hasn't been tried, uh, so that would be southern stocks of salmon, I'm assuming, that maybe are used to warmer waters or these other different conditions. <coughs> uh, to my knowledge, it's, I've never, I haven't heard of it happening, no. Um, is there information, accurate information out there on the ratio of hatchery fish to wild fish that are actually successfully coming back to the rivers, or being caught even? Like, do we know if the wild Yeah, so hatchery versus wild. wild. Uh, it depends what scale you look at. So in the Skeena, we have very few hatchery fish. Uh, there's a few small hatcheries, like Deep Creek on the Kalem, or 
which are more stock assessment tools. They tag the fish when they're young and count them in the Pacific, through the Pacific Salmon Treaty Program to estimate, help estimate numbers. So uh, in the Kitimat, there's a lot, lot more hatchery fish. Um, generally, wild stocks have been declining a little bit faster than hatchery, but there's been ha problem challenges with hatchery fish as well. When you look at the North Pacific scale, there's a real challenge because about half of the juvenile salmon that now go into the North Pacific are from hatcheries, ocean ranching facilities, mostly in Alaska and Russia, Japan. So you're putting out billions of salmon smolts every year into the North Pacific, and there's some indication that there's comp they're the care that we've reached carrying capacity and, and they're competing with each other for food and stuff like that. Wild salmon stocks. Like we're we're supporting the stock with the hatchery, but I'm just curious if like policy changes and all that are focusing on the wild numbers as measurements of success. Uh, there's a real focus on on wild fish uh, throughout most, especially northern BC. It's mm -hmm. by far wild fish that are out there. Uh, there's, they've done, there's been huge hatcheries in the Columbia system over the past 30, 40 years. And there's a lot of challenges there with the hatch, hatchery fish. Uh, there's been some collapses there in the hatchery populations. Uh, part of the problem is that <coughs> over time, you're breeding uh, individuals with fewer and fewer genetic, uh, less genetic makeup. I mean, essentially, you know, over time, it's, you, you really narrow the gene pool. It's like mating cousins, right? And so you, they don't do very well. At first, you see big spikes in production with hatchery facilities. But in the long term, there's a lot of problems, and they're really struggling with it in a lot of places right now. So to touch on what you were saying is a good question. Um, one of the things that I found that we face on the skein of watershed, and I know you, you were touching on hatchery. So the Pinkett Creek, Fulton Creek, Babine is to say that we don't have hatcheries. That would be kind of not really correct because our sockeye fishery, are basically, the, I would say the bulk of our sockeye fishery is propped up by hatchery fish. Um, to answer your question, quite honestly, the thing is, is that what it's allowed us to do. It, Greg, I would have liked to have seen if there was an opportunity for you to be able to show us historic numbers of sockeye, native sockeye, you know, so, some years ago. And I mean, we know we've had the fluctuations, but I'll go back to what I was saying is that by having these hatcheries, it's allowed us <coughs> to kind of prop up the commercial fishing fleet and allowed us to over harvest the native species. And so in turn, we end up losing, you know, the Williams Creek runs the small runs, the Kitwanda runs, and because as they're coming in, they're being harvested at a much higher rate during those years. And so we're, we're seeing a colla massive collapses of those runs because those are being mixed in with the hatchery numbers. Right? So Yeah, I, well, somewhat. somewhat. So the, the Pinga and Fulton, what you're talking about, these spawning channels in the Babine, they're not traditional hatcheries. They're not facilities where they raise you know, ha fish indoors. They're spawning channels that have been created, this perfect gravel, perfect water flow, and the wild fi or the fish go in there and spawn. So they're enhanced, but they're not a traditional hatchery. But the issue you're talking about, there's lots of challenges there. Because, uh, um, not overinflating the native numbers a lot. I mean, and if it wasn't, why would we take well, commercial what it fishing did boats into Babbing Lake? One, uh, one of my slides showed Skeen and Sockeye <laughs> over time, and we saw that kind of dropping in the 1950s when, and then they decided to put in the hatcheries. Well, that big reduction, that big drop was due to overfishing that right. then. Same with the, the reason, so Creek hatchery on Lake Else River back in. So they were able to do it, artificially boost those fish, but more recently, we, that th those fish aren't doing very well either. Right. They're coming out of Pinkett and Fulton, going into Babbing Lake. So it perpetuated the overfishing problem you're talking about. More recently, the challenges are, aren't overfishing, really, because our, our, our harvest rates are really uh, being really low, like 10 to 20% for sockeye in most years recently. So it's, it's shifted, right? 
but it is it's still a challenge it's still not trying to diminish the issue but how about herring over fishing well her herring is a prime food source for salmon of course so you're removing herring you're removing part of the food uh, I don't I'm not overly familiar with herring. There's not very many big herring fisheries on the north coast anymore. There's still big ones in Johnson Strait off Vancouver Island and stuff. It is a concern. There, there's down there, I know, uh, taking a lot of that food out of the system. Uh, but I'm, I would say on the north coast, it's not a huge issue. But still, you know, removing food isn't the best for for, for salmon, right? Yes, uh, just like the last time we were talking about <coughs> uh, logging. Mm -hmm. <coughs> My question was, I came here to learn more about what uh, your uh, justice are doing for the uh, needle stream habitat. I mean, uh, what, what, what's been done and what do you know about it? And, uh, what, you, what is uh, proposed for the, which I think the native streets are the most important areas to, to study first. And then second is the, uh, the fish farm issue. We need to deal with that also. Because yeah. that, that's a big impact on our, on our, on our native uh, salmon. So, so that and uh, the government would uh, learn a lot from us. Uh, I'm, I'm from Kespiox and I'm trying to get salmon. In 2013, we closed the river to food fishing. The kids said, we'll be close to food fishing. We took all our nets out, and nobody has fish for this winter of 20, uh, 2013. Mm -hmm. And the same thing again this year. Not only did we close the river to fishing, but we also changed all the fishermen's nets to 9 inch swimming, so all the soccer could go through. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the uh, government seems to be uh, uh, not uh, watching us and learning from us been doing this sort of things. So um, I was hoping that you would also promote that when you were talking to yourself to yeah. log in uh, BC. Well, uh, so a few different questions there. One was about the, the, the native streams and so the that the natal streams. So these are the smaller streams you're talking about. Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, those are absolutely critical and uh, what are we doing to protect them? Well, we're definitely uh, doing a lot of work around cumulative effects, looking at all the different stresses, roads, logging, industrial development, and trying to, there, there's been a lot of work done to show if, if you keep those stresses below a certain level, salmon do okay. If you, if they, if you have too many roads, too much clear cutting, uh, then you hit levels where you see serious impacts on fish. So one of the things we're trying to do, is we're promoting and we're working with some uh, First Nations like the Wet'suwet'en and the Lake Babine Nation to define, look at their territory, look at the impacts and, and assess where we have problems. And they're using that information to try to push government and industry to uh, not have too many impacts on their traditional territories around those streams. Um, in terms of fish farms, it's a real issue, uh, especially down south, but there's concerns here because uh, they're Atlantic salmon and the challenge is if you introduce new diseases that aren't familiar to Pacific salmon, that can have devastating effects. So that's probably the biggest concern in terms of where we are if those diseases get out there in the system, in the, in the ocean, in these fish, then that could, in theory, have serious, serious impacts on our fish. Uh, in terms of pushing for uh, better management, absolutely. I'm headed to Prince Rupert this afternoon. We have the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has their postseason review tomorrow and Friday. And a lot of the things I talked about in terms of what we can do about this issue, we're gonna be pushing for. I already know a lot of people who will be there who are pushing in the same direction. So. I think uh, just got to keep doing as much as we can. Okay. 
Greg, just on behalf of the group, I'd like to thank you for coming and giving an interesting talk. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how this all unfolds in the near future. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it.